welcome to episode two of the Ultimate Grinder Showdown Week. Today we're looking at the EG1 from Weber Workshops. This is a three and a half thousand dollar grinder, and it is a grinder obsessed with detail. Weber Workshops started out back in 2014 as Lynn Weber. Craig Lynn, I think, departed the company in 2018 and it became Weber Workshops. This is their electric grinder, I assume EG. They do a HG as well, which is a hand grinder, but this is the one that I was very interested in. Now, a lot has been made over the years over Douglas Weber's history as one of the team that worked on the Apple iPod. His background is in manufacturing and design and it really, it really shows in this particular grinder. And I think a good introduction to it is just to sort of walk you from top to bottom and highlight some of the details in the build, construction, uh, and sort of the way that this thing works that I think is just stunning. Starting at the top of the grinder, you can see the sort of fan at the top here, for keeping the motor cool. Moving down, you've got a beautiful little bean funnel. This is attached on two locking pins and a magnet, so you don't actually need any tools to detach it. Those magnets are gonna become a little bit of a theme for this grinder. Moving down, we have the locking ring here for your grind setting. And this is the only grinder that we're gonna look at in this whole week that actually locks its grind setting. Now that locking does mean it is a stepped grinder. So you can see the little markings here for each step. You lift this, move it, and drop it down into whichever step, finer or coarser that you want to go. As you'd expect, moving towards smaller numbers takes you finer, moving towards larger numbers takes you coarser. The steps, I think, are um, small enough Certainly, there are times where I wish they were a little tiny bit smaller, but I'm being very fussy there. I've never really had any major issues dialing in an espresso to be just the way that I want them. Moving down, we end up with this little platform here. And on this is the blind shaker that is the one accessory that comes with this that I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Now this platform is on a spring, so you can tilt it forward to easily remove it. And that way, when it's sat there, the shaker is sat close to the exit chute to minimize mess or, or sort of spray from static. This button here, allows you to move it up and down as you wish. It's a very nice little detail. Beyond that, you've got a start-stop button and uh, you've got a dial here for controlling the RPM of the grinder. And this runs up to about 1800 RPM, which is probably higher than you'd wanna go. I've generally run this at about 600 RPM most of the time. That isn't where the detail finishes. And just looking at it, touching it, you can see that the machining tolerances are tiny. Everything fits together beautifully. This is manufactured and assembled in Taiwan uh, and ships from there at the moment. Coming around the side, small little bean knocker that I think is a nice little detail, but it's attached to these outer pieces here. And this is, I think, just a little piece of magic. This is where the burrs are inside the grinder. So if you want to access the burrs, this pulls out. This comes out and, and you've actually exposed the burrs. They're sat right here inside the grinder, very close to each other because we're an espresso setting right now, but that's it. If you want to clean that burr chamber, no tools required whatsoever. That I think is, is beautiful. It's, it's so elegant, it's so nicely done. They fit together so nicely and everything feels just, just really, really well made. And it would need to be because this thing is three and a half thousand dollars. That is incredibly expensive for a coffee grinder, so you'd really want to know where your money is going, and build design is unquestionably a big part of that. Let's put it back together. I mean, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? How simple is that? And then you have your, your one accessory to this, which is the blind shaker. Essentially inside you've got this piece that acts as a sort of stopper at the bottom of this a sort of catch bin. So this drops in and you would grind into this thing. This sits on top to hold everything in place so you can give it a good shake. That would get rid of any clumps, help with better sort of distribution of particles. And then you would place this on your portafilter and ultimately pull this out and the coffee would fall through it into the portafilter below. Everything fits together very well, feels very nice, feels very solid and well made. Now the grinder does not come with a little spray bottle and I prefer to use a little spray bottle with this from a sort of messiness perspective. Having the, the, the blind shaker sit pretty close to the exit chute does reduce mess, but if you don't do this, you do get a bit of static. You will see some chaff round and about the grinder and, and that can be frustrating and a little bit messy. Let's pull a shot. Now, as you watch the RPM counter, as well as listen to the grinder, you can hear that the grinder is trying to achieve the desired RPM. And it's doing that by 
varying the amount of power being sent to the motor to try and keep it at that RPM. It will drift around a little bit, so if your target is 600, it will sometimes be below, sometimes above, it'll kind of wander around. When you finally clear the coffee from the burr set, it's suddenly easier to spin faster, so the RPM will go up and then come back down again. It's not my favorite part of this grinder. I like that the RPM is controllable, but that's true of most of the grinders we're gonna test this week. I don't love the way it executes that. It, it just doesn't sound as nice as this grinder feels and looks and generally is to use. I, I don't think it's doing anything bad to the coffee by any stretch. It, it's, just, it's just a complaint of mine. Once you've removed your central piece there, you need to give it a little swirl and then it will distribute generally pretty well. So let's talk about the burr set. This grinder comes with their core burr set, which is a little bit like the Legom P64, a hybrid burr set. You can get a more unimodal set as an additional uh, sort of upgrade or add-on, so to speak, but this one is designed for both espresso and brewed coffee. And I think it works well. Profile-wise, it's closer to a sort of more unimodal profile where espresso is sweet and clean and balanced, but not a ton of texture, but not absent texture either. I think it's a nice sort of hybrid burr from that perspective. There are other options that are more espresso focused as well. And if you're using this as nothing but a brewed coffee grinder, then I would consider the upgrade to a unimodal burr set that, or a more unimodal burr set anyway. Now you might think that the blind shaker is really built for espresso, but I actually really like it for most filter coffee applications. It's a nice way to distribute coffee bang into the center of a V60. You can get coffee into an AeroPress with a little funnel. It works well for most brewing methods. I don't have any issues with that. I don't wish it came with something different for grinding for filter coffee. And its profile for filter coffee, we will discuss in more depth in the head-to-head -head review at the end of the week where it'll be much more comparative tasting between all of these grinders. Now, one thing that I really love about the setup of this grinder is the way that the burrs are mounted on this thing. In most grinders, you'll expect to see two, sometimes three screws in the burrs holding them in place. That is not the case with this grinder. On this grinder, the burrs are held in place by a combination of pins and magnets again. That means that the, the burrs themselves have no unusual holes in them for putting screws through. Now, a lot of people worry about what happens if they chip a little bit of a burr, if a stone or something gets into their coffee, right? That small damage to one of the cutting teeth, does that ruin your espresso? I don't think it does, but it will have an impact. Much the same way that in every burr set, having three holes that don't have cutting teeth inside them must impact the burr set. With this, it's completely uniform. Every piece of the burr is the same all the way around, and I think that's super cool, and I think that does help produce excellent results in the cup. So to summarize, let's talk through the things that I like and the things that I don't like as much. What I like, unquestionably, is the build. It's, it's so well made, every detail just feels thought through. The, the materials choice, it, it, it looks beautiful. This is a incredibly well made thing and that brings me pleasure to look at in the morning to use day to day. I think the way that it comes to pieces is incredibly thoughtful as well. I love that you can access the burr chamber with zero tools in, a, in less than 10 seconds. I think the detail everywhere from the spring lever here, the little thwacker at the back there, it, it's all great detail. I think it makes delicious coffee incredibly enjoyable. It is a big grinder. There's no denying this. It's tall, it won't fit under most countertops. It's relatively wide. It's not that deep, but it is a big, pretty heavy thing. This may not fit in every home, but if you've got space in your kitchen and well, space wherever you make your coffee, then it would probably look pretty great there. I think it can be a bit messy if you don't use a little spray bottle now and again, and that has been a frustration when I've used lighter roasted coffees that do have a little bit more chaff around them. I, I wish the, the way that it sounded when it's grinding sounded a little bit different. I wish it wasn't hunting out its desired RPM and sort of moving around in that manner. Uh, it doesn't reassure me the way that the build of this thing does overall. I don't think it impacts coffee, but it, it does somewhat impact my experience. Then there's the price. It's three and a half thousand dollars before it is shipped to you wherever you are in the world, and I paid about $150 in shipping. That is a staggering amount of money. Whether it's worthwhile is a question you have to ask yourself, and it's not the only grinder we'll look at at that kind of a price point, but it is incredibly expensive. But you see where your money is going, and I think that's important. 
I think that's what you want to see. Every detail here has been considered, every materials choice has obviously been considered, uh, and that's, that's hard not to like. It, it's a very aesthetic experience, it's very enjoyable. I am impressed. Do I wish it was cheaper? Absolutely. Do I think it's overpriced? No, I do not. It's a small company producing a small number of beautiful things. They're not buying tens of thousands of pieces to bring the costs down. They don't have scale to bring that cost down. And so I am understanding of that high, high price. But if you've got the cash, if this appeals to you, then I think you'll have a very enjoyable coffee experience with this grinder. I don't get to keep this particular grinder because this goes to one of my Patreon supporters because my Patreon supporters give me a budget every month to go and buy equipment to review for you. And because I buy it, I don't get loaners or freebies from manufacturers. The reviews, I hope, are unbiased. I'll certainly miss having this grinder around. And if you want to know which one of these five that I would keep, well, then you'll have to watch the head-to-head -head coming a little bit later. If it's live, there'll be a link in the description down below. If not, I hope you tune in very soon for the next episode of this Ultimate Grinder Showdown. For now, I'll say thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day.